So we have something a little different for you all this week. We're just going to talk about the whole campaign I just ran. Oh, boy. That makes me the whole thing. anxious. Uh, you should really? feel so relieved. Yeah, you should feel the opposite. You should feel relieved. It's over. Yeah, I am. And it I went am. really, really well, too. And yeah. it went well. I'm glad you guys think so. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, no, nothing ever goes exactly according to plan. But yeah, I thought the overall effect was very, very effective. The effect was effective. Go ahead. <laughs> so I guess the first thing I kind of want to talk about is just in terms of, if we're talking about the whole season, is just sort of, and I want to hear from, from you all, because this is one of the things I quite like about D&D, is that it's sort of the ultimate uh, in like modern fantasy, where it's like very pastiche. Everyone brings their own sort of tropes and ideas, and you get them slammed together in this great um, gumbo of stuff. So I kind of want to talk about just the general tropes and archetypes that sort of served as the foundation that we are mixing together in this in this game. I obviously had my ideas, but I want to hear like about from you guys, like what were some sort of character tropes or, or uh, story tropes that inspired you as you were creating your characters to bring to this adventure? The biggest and most obvious narrative trope, I think, is like mystery, right? Something has been stolen, go find it. But like when I built Illipel, I did not care about building a character that would service that plot at all. It was more like the idea of master and minion and the city personified and like how people work within the character of a city was something that was more important in building my character to match specific tropes. The trope I ignored was probably the most forward trope of the entire campaign, which was the mystery at hand. So that was the narrative trope for me that I was paying attention to. The character tropes that were important to me or the character archetypes that I found interesting and valuable were anything having to do with, I don't know how to put it. There's probably a better word. Scala, you'll find it instantly, I'm sure. But like the idea of like you have to put me first to succeed in a place like Ravnica and like the politicking that goes with all of that, like that archetype of, of the selfish person obviously was something that I wanted to explore with Illipel. And yeah, I, I thought that was interesting. We talked about it um, in one of our table talks recently, but uh, when you have characters like Vim who are very like sagely in their approach, like, that's another archetype that I expected we would come across. Um, trying to think of archetypes I didn't expect. Um not knowing too much about Ravnica, I did not expect any Rakdos type. Like, <laughs> those were archetypes I was not expecting. I actually was, and I don't want to steal your thunder to <laughs> Clork, uh, but I did expect Clork and, and that subset of any characters coming from Clork's backstory to be, like, dutiful to the guild. That was an archetype, mm -hmm. uh, archetype I was totally expecting. Sure. I didn't know enough about Golgari to know what any of Andy's characters or backstory characters I'll, have been. I'll talk about I'll talk about mine, but that's not something that was inherent to the world. That was very much a May thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt, it felt like it based on and actually this real quick. I'll add this because is it's very apparent at this point, two seasons in. I am not someone that does a lot of deep dives into lore, but I actually did do a lot of reading of the source book for this particular campaign. Because Illipel's very much someone that tries to be in the know, and it would have been a disservice to the character if I didn't do some due diligence. So I was surprised by some of the archetypes coming from, uh, I mean, not just Alwyn, but Lana and Edric. Like, those were all surprising archetypes and, 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 um, uh, and character threads throughout the season for me. Now, something about Illipel. Um, Illipel seemed kind of out of place in all of the... Um catholic like religious types of themes of the orzhov you know you're more of like a wheeling and dealing uh kind of business person which is definitely exists within the orzhov but you didn't have that kind of the reverence yeah. you know i was i was bouncing between um i think it's demir and orzhov for a while for that exact reason like uh, you know some of the typical things i would expect from orzhov in terms of like the the, the catholic um all the Catholic imagery and some of, uh, and just, you know, their way of being was not something I associated with Illipel. And I struggled with it at first because it's just not Illipel. But then I also got to thinking like, Illipel do, like does not 
there's no integrity there. Like, Illipel does not give a shit about ceremony and, like, will literally just co-opt anything if it provides them an ounce of influence or power. Um, and there were elements to the Demir, and I at, the, at this time I can't remember what they were, that I just didn't enjoy. And it wasn't even mechanically. It was just like, I don't... Orzhov felt much more like the type of guild that would want to obtain and provide its guild members with information, which to Illipel is the ultimate trade. I, I think I know what this is. It's it's about being seen, right? It exactly. matters to Illipel that their influence is known to everyone around them. Exactly. With the Demir, your name is not important. Your name changes every week. Um, you, who you are as an individual is not important. It's about the organization and about who you can manipulate and who you can right. exert influence on. But Illipel, it's all about them. And I think right. that fits well with the Orzhov because they don't, they don't buy a lot of this, uh, you know, ceremony too. They, yeah, it's, it's they, just trimming. It's just there. Yeah, they utilize flare. this, fa this yeah. facade and this, decades of or excuse me decades millennia of <laughs> religious decades. history to maintain this mystique of what is basically just a a loan shark right. a, a giant fucking loan shark right um, and 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 even if that weren't true like illipel is air, like even if you know orjav were the type of guild that truly believed and and to the letter of of their own you know of their own law, all of those things regarding all of that Catholic imagery, Illipel's arrogant enough where they would just be convinced they could fake it well enough and climb up anyway. So to me, I, I reconciled that. It took a little bit though. It took like, I, I think I noodled on that guild for like a couple days worth of creating the character. Um, and then, yeah, I, it may have been something in the book that I read where it was just like, Demir is very much like an organization and Orzhov is very much people in an organization and Illipel is in it for mm. themselves. And that's way more important than relig religion. Illipel could care less. It's a great question, though. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, because I would have never remembered to talk about that. Clork? Oh. Yeah, so... So, Clork, I mean... I think the... The idea of Clork as... Uh, a goblin that exists within this larger organization of, of the Izzet League... As I was like first reading about the Izzet League and the goblins and stuff like that, I wanted to do something that was very of the world. And something I think that kind of comes naturally to me was all of this kind of like techie, tinkery kind of shit. So I went with that. And uh, obviously give him that, you know, New York wise guy kind of voice. Because uh, that's something I can do well. But I liked this idea that, or I was intrigued by this idea that the Izzet goblins, it's not just that they're employees of the League. They kind of are a population that has always existed within the League. You know, they're like almost an ethnicity that just is part of the League. Um, and so Clark is born into that. His culture is one of being an employee of this company, basically. Mm. Um, but it also is not fully, you know, it's not like a big corporate, like capitalist corporation. It's... There's, you know, it's it feels more, it's, it's um, more like, like a public works project. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like IBEW, like yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, and that's why when I when we did the dossiers, I Clark's legal name is just a bunch of numbers. Clark <laughs> is a nickname, right? Yeah. Um, and so, and he always kind of, um, he always kind of defers to the league, to the people who rank above him. He, um, is very quick to kind of seize the power that belongs to him, but will immediately defer to those that outrank him and just funnel all of his own power upwards because he knows that maybe one day he'll be up there and that the people up there might deserve it, which, you know, that's has nothing to do with my own beliefs, but um, no. you know. <laughs> it's almost a study in, in contrasts. But yeah, um, I think it, it's something like inbuilt, right? Like, some number of millennia ago, Ravnica was like your normal fantasy world, right? And 
you know, Niv-Mizzet was just like a normal dragon, you know, sitting in a lair and had some goblin minions. And, you know, the descendants of those goblins are now, you know, the clerks of the world. Uh, and it's interesting <laughs> to see how that sort of Right. And that's how because... Scala landed on Farnsworth for Niv-Mizzet's voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because Ravnica is just Futurama. <laughs> um. Something else I wanted to do, though, with Clork was that I, I wanted him to be representative of that kind of class of both goblin, but also is it worker, just these people who make the thing go, you know, um, I didn't want him to stand out too much as a uh, sort of a main character. I mean, obviously, he is a player character and player characters are extraordinary, but he should be representative of what most goblins in the league are. At, at least, i that's how I was trying to play him. I wasn't trying to attract too much attention to Clork in the larger world. Okay. <laughs> We're all looking at Andy. <laughs> oh, I, I, thought, I thought there was going to be a response there. Um, no, it's great, because Jimmy said, I'm trying not to try attract too much attention, and then we move on to Andy. <laughs> <laughs> it's meta. It's meta. What about Alwyn? <laughs> Um, so I've, I've generally talked about this before with Alwyn. Um, I primarily was inspired once I landed on a character concept as far as character attributes, druid, spore druid, Golgari. Then I looked at a lot of the art specifically for the, the Golgari lands and Ravnica lands in general, which are all incredibly gothic and all of the ruined castles and cathedrals and all of these old really really old structures um that have been sort of transformed by time and and the golgari inhabitants and everything um i really wanted to tap into the the feudalism that was sort of implied in a lot of the undercity rhetoric um so i you know said i was from this sort of lesser house um sort of got this you know feudal matron lord um and built this background um with scala and sort of in that i did land on a trope of well this is basically just getting to be game of thrones which the way Jeppy was starting to spin his character and sort of the way um, a lot of the interpersonal narrative what seemed like it was going to play very early in the campaign, I was like, this is actually unironically great. Like, I'm just going to lean into this. Um, and I thought it was really, really, really good. Do you think yeah. Alan thinks he's the hero of the story? Not of, certainly not of this main quest that we, you know, had been sent on um, mm. for the for the guild pact. No, um, I don't even know that Alwyn is sort of the hero of his own story in the same way, you know, unironically that the trope of like John at the wall, he he had no notions of heroism, right? It's more duty. Yeah. Um, and and very much underlined um and that can put you in places of heroic actions but that's not necessarily what is going through his mind yeah i don't i don't think anyone's a hero here and you know i'm sorry i mean i meant does alan believe that i'm not saying is alan the hero does alan bring oh, that yeah yeah mm. but I, and and i don't think alan is someone who ver who views heroism as virtuous if Right. I can say that. Um, you know, Illipel and Alwyn had some conversations about this kind of thing. Um, you know, the self motivation and the, you know, getting past getting past sort of rhetorical narrative and what do people really want and all of this stuff. I thought, you know, it came out in the game very well. Mm -hmm. I think there's, you know, an acceptance of one's insignificance built into. Uh, a lot of the guilds, and I think the Swarm is one of them, yeah. uh, very much. So you you do your part to see that the 
the order, the natural order is maintained. But that is, that, that is not heroism. That is necessity. That is what must be done, in my mind. Uh, yeah, for sure. Like, I think because of the, the spins I put on Stonehaven and that corner of the Undercity, um, it felt a lot more sort of personalized than, say, when we met any Thrall or any Devkarn who are very much more, you know, we are a drone of the swarm, right? This is more, I am serving my house on behalf of this empire. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting how how these characters ended up working their way into my ideas of a plot that I had constructed. Uh, you know, I, I try to be fairly flexible with these things, but I definitely wanted to capture one of my favorite aspects of Ravnica, which is a lot of this, like, uh, you know, it's set in fantasy Prague. There's a lot of, like, Cold War-style... Um, mistrust and double dealing and uh and a, a, a mystery seemed like a good way to uh, sort of have your characters navigate that type of narrative where there are a bunch of factions and and powers that have their own agendas and you sort of have to move through them and see if you can get what you need by negotiating what all of them want that mm. follows. Um, were there any NPCs? Maybe you want to talk more about some of the ones that you created, um, but NPCs that had character tropes that you enjoyed, um, that, yeah, that you enjoyed playing or, or putting in the world. Um, let's see. I mean, I, I have fun with a lot of my NPCs, but I, I think, um, we didn't spend enough time with any of them for me to feel like uh, I I really knew them very well, right? Mm. I, uh, I definitely wanted to do the, the full panorama of you guys, like, go all around the 10th, have some little bit of interaction with somebody from every guild, but you guys were bouncing around a lot, so I didn't really get to sit in an NPC yeah. that long. Um, I liked playing, uh, I will say I liked playing Edric just because, you know, Andy's really fun to bounce off of with that bullshit. Um, <laughs> so much and bullshit. I think that relationship of, of the two, uh, you know, rival brothers is, you know, it's a classic and I'm glad I got to play that. Uh, I like Zytha as a character. She, you know, shows up. I, I, I'm sort of like, I, I'm like sort of interested in what her deal is and what her story is, right? She was kind of just a helpful NPC and now I'm like, hmm, I wonder where she's going with this whole Irregulars thing. Did she make it out of the Century Square riot all right? Like, what's her deal now? Um, so maybe I'll check back on her and see what happened to her. Uh, I liked, yeah, uh, again, I, I didn't really get to stew in anybody, uh, which again was Part of my goal, but yeah. I, I I had fun with everybody, but they were kind of... I didn't really get to build any extra dimensions into anyone in the time we had. You're forgetting two very good ones. Yeah, Rena I'm, I'm sure. is awesome. And you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and Basil Gurch. And, oh. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Yeah. And, and yeah, you did not get to stew in Basil Gurch long enough for Basil Gurch to make a stew for everybody. It's <laughs> <laughs> it only a matter of <laughs> Jimmy. <laughs> thank you for that laugh. It was very Basil Gurch has like what six minutes of screen time in this entire campaign. <laughs> <laughs> the most in, talked about more character. In the, <laughs> more in the table talk than in any of the episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's world famous. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, we even talked Tom, about Tom Basil Gurch right. in episode twelve. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, some some people just make an impression. I think Tomek made in one scene in the beginning just what it just felt like such a fleshed out character. Was Tomek's just, a lore character. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I know that. But like, just the way, like, just I don't know. It's that line 
we're not interested in excuses. We're interested in remuneration. It just, mm. oh, it's delivered right. It's the right words, and it just feels like, oh, I believe in. I believe this character is real. I don't know. Tomic, Thank you. Tomic to me, it really was balanced between the trope of like <laughs> Russian middle management mobster, but it feels. Real, I don't know. I like Tomic's first scene with Illipel is still a, yeah. a real high mark for me for the whole season. Do you think Tomic and Ral talked about us over dinner at any point? Oh, for oh, fucking sure. Just at home, just like so. So, what do you think of these guys? Yeah, wait, these wait, fucking they're actually gonna What are they doing? Do this? Are they gonna pull this off? <laughs> do you think it caused them str- like at dinner? Do you think it caused them stress or like did they have a laugh about us? Which one do you think it would be? <laughs> I think it caused Ral stress because I think Ral is kind of anxious. Uh, I think it gave Tomic a laugh. Uh, I think Tomic <laughs> is definitely the more the more composed, the more uh, you know. I don't. I don't. Yeah, things will sort themselves out. It's yeah, yeah. The, the the more like like organized, like yeah. thoughtful person who's like, yes, yes, this will less reactive. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it sounds like we're starting to talk about the first arc of the adventure, or as you have labeled in your campaign wrap-up show notes, the investigation, episodes one through five. Yes. <laughs> so Basil Gurch. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the first, the first hook, the first set of hooks was kind of just a way to get you guys to the fight with Vinzola, which... Uh, was the thing um i don't know i don't i don't like talking about my own work i i feel so weird can't you guys just take this they say after 12 table talks uh Um, what was the justification for um vim bringing alwyn in uh good at finding things yeah we don't know where it is we need a we need a scavenger who might be able to find something so here Uh, in the wrap up the most sense actually you've got you've got a decent perception mod uh, modifier and you're not (laughs) you don't have any real guild affiliation or or obligations right now come come work for the guild pact we could use you so so here in here in the campaign wrap up i'm gonna i'm gonna spoil a little headcanon that i've been kicking around for a long time okay and that is when Vim shows up at Stonehaven and says, I've been here before. Player, I think that Vim is the one that delivered Alwyn and Edric to Stonehaven after being orphaned. Wow, that's insane. Should yeah, go say all that on mic? Save that shit. <laughs> I, I, don't want, I don't want them to reveal that, but I'm just saying that's... Like, that started cooking then, because how, otherwise, how would Niv fucking Mizzet know who these two humans are? Like, especially Niv Mizzet, um, alluding several times to forgetting people and names. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to say anything on that. That's a crazy theory. I I like it. (laughs) Um, uh... (laughs) <laughs> something I really other. enjoyed. All right, I will. T- I will talk about. I will talk about my work, but it's really about you guys. Uh, something I really enjoyed in the first several episodes was how quickly you guys established a working relationship and and strong sort of character interactions. Right, like that was something that was really exciting to see. You guys talk about that now and how when you all met together, uh, uh, like how 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 it felt sort of. Working alongside each other and, and that sort of thing. Clark was the uh, boss of this outfit. And so after the whole campaign wrapped up, had to fill out some performance reviews. And I got to say, all <laughs> of the personal drama was really getting in the way of the ultimate goal here. So what did we get? <laughs> like a needs improvement or like meets meets expectations? Yeah, I was skeptical when Ralph first asked, you know, how are you all working together? You know, it was fine. We we were getting our work done and whatever. And then Illipel goes and does whatever bullshit that is, ends up cutting off their own finger and forgets several weeks of the entire campaign. And, yeah. you know, lost no, at valuable that point, data. At that point, I don't know that it was a successful uh, experiment in guilds working together, because even though we got to our goal in the end, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't uh, perhaps the the best uh, way of solving such a problem maybe one single guild on its own 
I'm not going to say which, uh, could have maybe done this job a little better. <laughs> Probably. I would agree. How different? That's what Clark would, would have wrote, written in his performance reviews. How different would this one. have been if, like, we just all played Is It PCs? <laughs> I mean, it would have been a completely oh, different adventure. Just... <laughs> like, I wouldn't have written the same adventure for three is it PCs. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what it would have been. Uh, spitballing, like, right off the top of my head. Uh, there's, oh uh, no, actually, I don't want to say because that might be stuff I'll use for later. Potential um, one shots. Potential yeah, one shots. Yeah. Yeah, well, we could game it out. Like, same, same mystery, different everything else, but same mystery with just like three is it goblins. Hmm. Oh man. What even happens? I don't know. I feel like you you get uh you get stonewalled a lot more because it is just one guild. Uh, there like isn't like there isn't that good work like you're not guild pact agents, so people are maybe a little more suspicious of you. Uh, you maybe you True. have to fight more, you know. Yeah. It would have been two episodes. Episode 1, get our mission, start to build a car. Episode two, finish car, car flies, fly directly into the top of the spire and run over Jalen. Win. <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't know about Jalen. We, we would have but had we to, would, we would have spent six episodes in the cerebral jelly. Yeah. yeah. You would have spent a lot more time <laughs> yeah. in the cerebral jelly. <laughs> Downtime oh would have God. been us playing in cerebral jelly like it's a fucking ball pit at a McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, man. Um, I'm here for that campaign. <laughs> oh, I had a thought. Let me find it. Um, oh, yeah. So not to compare apples to oranges, but I'm going to go ahead and do it for a minute. Um, something that really helped sort of speed the character interactions along, I think, was the fact that Jeppy's heel character this time around actually liked talking. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, we 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 have a Jeppy heel in season one, and they're just completely self interested and says maybe five words to the rest of the party. Yeah. You know, every Wait, game. What is a Jeppy heel? Like you're a, playing a heel. Yeah. And your name is Jeppy. Yeah. Heel. What, what the hell is a heel? So heel. in wrestling, the villain is called a heel. Yeah. Is it just a wrestling thing? I mean, it's it's definitely gone beyond. This That's point, where it started, but, it, but now yeah, it comes I think it, from, it comes from wrestling. Yeah. Oh, like the yeah, heel heels turn. Faces. That's a you know big oh, thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I think I think Illipel is more a heel than cl- uh, Clicks. To be fair, no, I don't. Not compared <laughs> to Andromeda and Gron. <laughs> Clicks is very much a heel in that situation. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. but I, I see what you're yeah, yeah. I'm, but I'm saying comparing the two together, Cl- Clicks doesn't yeah. even fucking come close to Illipel. That's yeah. true. Yeah, Clicks is a heel because. <laughs> Andromeda and Gron exist. That's it. <laughs> well, I also, you know, sort of just being observant, um, I also feel like our characters are just really fleshed out for this campaign. Like, yeah. we'd put a lot into their backstories. We put a lot into how we want them to fit into the world, which is something that Scala did yeah. masterfully. Like, you know, presenting the questions of, you know, um, NPCs, which is something that happened, you know, for for putting together Theros, but how those NPCs that we wanted to bring to the game sort of fit into the the structure of the world and the structure of the narrative was just really great. It's like everything fit together. I think the other part of that, too, is comfort level. I can only speak for myself, but like we're learning how to podcast. We're learning how to D&D podcast specifically. So like it's a couple things. It's being more confident in using voices on mic. It's more confident mm-hmm. and comfortable knowing what a 12 episode arc looks like and demands. So like going into season one, I was nervous about speaking on mic, about a character voice, about how much backstory we would even get to explore, if any. So it, for my own comfort, it made sense to have a character that is a little reserved. <laughs> we'll put it kindly yeah. to clicks. Um, and then after getting over that comfort and getting through what I was really happy with uh, season one broadly, but then also just my personal character arc with clicks, I was like, okay, now I'm more confident. I'm more comfortable. I want to put more into this, you know, and that doesn't mean I didn't put oh, yeah. a lot into clicks. It's just, I didn't put as much into clicks for my own security and safety going into trying to do a podcast. Right. And I don't know if you, Jimmy, or well, Andy, you DM season one, so it probably doesn't apply as much to you, but I don't know if you, Jimmy, felt the same way. 
Well, I think I I, I kind of felt that way. Um, uh, definitely in feeling comfortable speaking into a microphone, what I'm going to say, uh, and then what kind of things will get edited out, what kind of things definitely stay in. Yes, and I yeah. think that, like, in, you know, in the long run, I only fully edited five episodes before Scala took over and has done all of the editing since then. Um, but there's just certain, we're making different decisions in like the way we're saying things and what we're leaving in and what we're being careful about. And what we're just, it's, it flows a lot better now. You guys remember that, um, Jeffrey Epstein joke from like episode three that we cut out? Oh, I think man. That, that probably would have been left in now if we did it now. You know what I mean? What? Yeah. <sighs> Oh, yeah, okay. I do remember <laughs> that, actually. <laughs> I had to think for a second. Yeah. Because yeah. there was a big Volkos cliffhanger. <laughs> right. No, not that. That was a stupid okay. joke. No, yeah. but the when the Yeti screamed Oh, it, yeah, right? okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great, too. Yeah. So, I don't know. Just uh, That was just one example I thought of. But there's all... Oh, even, like, little continuity things that we felt the need to... Mm. Tiny little things that we felt the need to fix that, like, you know... You know, a lot of it's water yeah. under the bridge at this point. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, uh, I think, yeah, also, like, just in terms of the way we're putting out the content on the back end, in terms of editing, there's just more confidence in, like, we can leave dumb shit in there. We can leave these things in there. And it, you know, yeah, yeah, it, it's just, it's interesting to, and maybe we'll do, like, a, once we get through all first four seasons, we'll do, like, a full retro of, like, what it was like to have all of that whole experience going across the panel. DMs, a panel. Um, DM good panel, idea. Yeah. But that's an interesting thing to talk about when we if we ever do something like that for sure. Um we should talk a little bit about it just to keep us on the rails for Ravnica encounters for the first you know, that whole investigation piece. We should talk a little bit about that. Um I mean, Scala, it's real cute that you just put some goop describe the hardest the oozes fight. that almost <laughs> TPKs us <laughs> in episode two. <laughs> uh, that was your descriptor, actually, Jeffy. In the in the recap for episode three, you said we fought some goop. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it, this is sort of a side effect of me running a new system, right? I like can generally anticipate what the average of a of a of a die is going to be, and how. Uh, how uh, difficult or easy that's going to make an encounter. Uh, but, you know, there's some things I'm not accounting for, like the Afadigato Dice Curse, or mm. um, just like... Now you've cursed my whole family. It's not just a Jimmy thing anymore. <laughs> you <laughs> and, and your all house. your generations to follow. <laughs> it's been um, happening since the, the Elden days, and the Afadigatos were still in Italy. Oh, I can't wait till Elden Ring comes out! <laughs> oh, same. Um... <laughs> But I, you know, it, it definitely is trial and error, uh, and I feel like every every encounter is always an untested prototype. Uh, is uh, something I think Matt Colville says uh, mm, about yeah. about encounter design. Is you can always sort of tweak things on the fly if the encounter is not playing out the way you anticipated. And uh, again, I I don't like I'm not a person who believes in pulling punches. Or sort of letting the players win, but there's definitely uh, every encounter is supposed to have a, a, a feel to it, and everything that I do is in service to making the world feel like an actual place, an actual place that can kill you, but uh, sometimes some goop that fell out of a bioluminescent lantern isn't the thing that should kill, you know. <laughs> Th Heroes three on a new three, quest. <laughs> three guild mages, right? Uh, one would think. One would you know, think. You plan, you plan, you plan against like, oh, okay, you know, we've got Jimmy dice, but we also have Andy dice. But like, what happens when Andy dice become Jimmy dice in the same encounter? And Jimmy dice, Jimmy dice. <laughs> Oof. Interesting that you called us mages there in that instance, and it made me think, Andy, did you play Alwyn more martial because? Jeppy and I are both just like straightforward casters. Um, that was sort of my intention from the start. Um, and it just happened to work out. Just happened to work out that even though we were playing three full casters for a three-person party, which is bananas, <laughs> um, that I that I did pick that I did pick one of, if not the most martial druid subclass. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Well, and I suppose um, Illipel was also doing quite a bit of uh, melee attacking. Yeah, it's funny you say that because, like, I, I mean, Bard is a caster class, but like, I didn't feel like a caster inherently in in session. And, like, I Dissonant Whispers is a spell, but it doesn't feel like a spell. I don't know why. I have no rationale for that opinion. I just, you know, like, maybe it's because I have yet to ever play um a wizard or sorcerer like a traditional like you, you cannot argue that that's a class or caster um but i don't know i just didn't feel like i don't feel like i've yet crossed the threshold of having played a, a, a caster class yet even though i just finished a season as a bard i think the thing about bard that does differentiate it is there's no real offensive cantrip other than vicious mockery and vicious yeah. mockery is is weak uh, you know, in terms of offensive cancer, it's like oh, once God, you've yeah. cast your spell and you're looking for other things to do, uh, a true mage will uh, turn to, uh, you know, a cantrip to deal damage, uh, whereas a sort of half caster or not real bards aren't really a half caster, but like a the utility uh, caster, a utility caster yeah. may switch to melee. Right. I like that uh, you kind of took us all over the city with these um, suspects we had to follow, we had to track down. That was just the one episode of just kind of looking around, learning about different guilds, learning about different uh, precincts, not districts. Right. <laughs> right. District is the big one, yeah. right? We're yes. all in the 10th district all the time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, again, that was one of my, one of my goals was make sure there, there was a little bit of, opportunity to interact with every guild uh, hmm. did we We got every guild in there yes i believe so so in episode one you dealt you went into a boros garrison to find those three goobers uh, you also snuck right. past a boros checkpoint obviously the azorius ended up being a villain at the end uh and uh, you know you had to fight a bunch of them uh mm -hmm. then uh the demir were the villain of the first arc with vinzola uh the Golgari, we had a character from the Golgari, the Orzhov and it also covered the same way. Rakdos showed up at uh, the exchange to mm -hmm. uh, ruin everyone's day. Yeah. You stopped the Simic, briefly. We use, utilized the Simic. That was, yeah. Edric was the way into that. The Selesnia, you had that little um, uh, uh, brief little detour into uh, the Beast Havens to deal with uh, Lady Vesmona and her beasts that Anor. could have become more of a thing but again the whole vichugazi vigil didn't really concern yeah. any of their characters so it was right. just None a thing all. that was tangentially going on yeah. uh gruel goblins showed up in the very beginning uh and you sort of encountered uh, and uh some various denizens out in the rubble belt when you did your bit of adventure there the uh, Etten was part of the gruel right mm -hmm. yes probably part of the probably a wayward gore clan member i would say um just hanging around at a crossroads being wow uh, a, a little goober um, was that 10 did we get all of them yeah that was uh I, I guess so wow nice yeah it's not like theros where you have to account for an additional five yeah, <laughs> right no, no nothing monochrome on ravnica um nothing like mechanically nothing nothing really works that way well the the um ravnica? What are they called? The allegiances? No, the where the two guilds have a common color. They printed oh, cards. Oh, you're these. talking about um, you're talking about those bonds. I was the talking bonds. About. Yes. Yeah, those are all monocolored cards, and there are like monocolored people and denizens on Ravnica. They just don't have any like like permanent organizations or associations or anything like that. Like uh, uh, one instance, there's like a lot of white cards that are Hazda, which are sort of like a uh, a militia that is not guild associated they're uh you know sort of uh like the town watch for various precincts but they don't have the same authority that the azorius or the boros do and they're mono white but uh, there's not like a lot of that like monochrome stuff that is organized in the same way heliod has a religion and perforos has a religion on theros right right interesting so that was that's the the investigation, the yeah. first part. I like the 
the downtime. I think that really broke up the season really nicely. You've got before downtime and after downtime. And then downtime itself was like some of the most fun of the entire thing. It was And it was also compelling very, and it felt like the yeah. story didn't stop like the investigation stopped, but it felt like the machinations of Ravnica kept turning, so it didn't feel like a detour in the story. Oh, the right. downtime was so good. Yeah. Mm. I um I purposefully didn't put any downtime in Theros because I really believe that it shouldn't be in a game, even if you're playing a campaign over the course of, like, dozens of, of games. I don't think it should be in a game unless there are, like, objectives that your players really want to do or you as a DM want to convey a lot of, like, side angles that you're just not going to cover. I thought this was an excellent like example of how downtime can be compelling for all yeah. three characters it's funny you say that um because i felt the after coming out of this ravnica campaign i was like every campaign needs downtime but as no. we've gone on <laughs> to work on subsequent seasons which we'll get into a little later i'm starting to agree with you andy like yeah i actually don't know if downtime is all it, it when it's warranted it's amazing but it's not always warranted and I was like, oh, my God, downtime is so good because in Ravnica, it was so good. Right. For, yeah. it, this was a good example. But, like, don't conflate downtime with, like, a shopping scene, right? Those right, are two different right. things. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. you can have a character not be busy with their quest for a morning, in which case they do something fun. That's fine. But this was two entire in-game weeks where the wheels kept turning. Yeah. Oof, right. So good. And where the DM asks us, you know, what are you going to do right. when, you know, there's no one telling you what to do? And yeah. and our characters had like enough um, personal investment to, you know, yeah. have some really crazy scenes. Oh, my God. And like we've, <laughs> you know, we've talked about those scenes in the table talk. So if you're listening and you're not uh, on the Patreon, do that. But. I want to because we talked about this earlier this in this t in this talk back right here, which is the idea of um, the world feeling very full because things are existing the entire time. One of those examples shined in downtime, which is like in the beginning of the campaign, Alwyn is talking to on Elgast and we don't know mm -hmm. that until later. And it's like it just makes the world feel full because it's like. She's there. She has her own life and her the gears of her world keep turning in this city and it's just awesome. Like that eternal was probably in the kitchen in Alwyn's first scene and it's just so cool to like listen back and realize that. I completely agree. Like why use a different random like crossroads dive bar when you can just make it the same place coincidentally, you know, quote unquote coincidentally. And just connect it one more degree than you already yeah. had. Yeah, and it's not ham-fisted because, like, I told Scala, Anelgast is in Golgari, not knowing you were going to play Golgari, by the way. That was another, uh, like, bit of serendipity here in this whole campaign that we've, mm. we've worked through. Yeah. yeah, there's just, there's so much to, there were, there was good combat, the NPCs were awesome, like, the downtime phase was just so good and it also it also really showcased the the pc's sort of side quests slash personal quests um like you know this isn't as this isn't as dramatic as what happened with alwyn you know rescuing idrik or illipel's fucking <laughs> undercover sting uh gone awry <laughs> but um you know clork sticking up to um you know his i guess you would say like former rival in the is it at the library just being like yeah you'll get yours um happened happened during downtime yeah that was a uh, uh vazo yeah who is a canon character right not Vazo's different of. different different vazo that vazo lived and died 70 years ago uh, oh okay i believe it's just uh <laughs> I legitimately just pointed to a name in the <laughs> goblin name section of the Ravnica book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Because... It, but I, th my issue with that is that little section of goblin names in the Ravnica book has, like, n named characters in it. Like, why not make up new names? Well, anyway, maybe, oh, they, whatever. maybe they like naming their goblins after other famous goblins. 
Yeah, that could be it. Like the Minotaurs and Theros. Hmm. Um, Scala, I have a question. Yeah. It's been w- hold on. Wait, wait, wait. We're oh, talking about Vazo. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, I would just want to say, Vazo was uh, Clark's direct supervisor in his new role after falling from grace. Mm. Um, so, oh. like, Vazo would have been his, like, like Clark directly reported to Vazo as, like, a shitty little electrician. Right. Had he not and been so, scooped up by the, by the guild pack. Yeah, by Ral, yeah. And um, Vazo was kind of a petty tyrant mm. in, in Clark's backstory. Um, oh okay so like uh but like review the time card that kind of like workplace tyrant or yeah and so clark was really ready to like be like haha i'm working with the guild pack now fuck you vazo but then vazo was like no i still outrank you i'm working with uh you know uh major domo chamberlain marie chamberlain marie sorry (laughs) no that's fine i made that mistake too (laughs) chamberlain marie and uh, then Clark was like, oh, well, sorry, I mistaked you for someone that I can shit all over right now. <laughs> so, see you later. Yeah. What are you saying, Jeppy? Yeah, no, I, I, I cause, uh, we were talking about the Illipel sting gone wrong, and I was like, holy shit, I forgot to ask this question, even just when chatting with Scala and also in any table talk. But, like, how did Anel Gas know it was Illipel? Because she came to visit after. I didn't leave any evidence. How did she know it no, was but you. But you took things that were hers. She is a high-level wizard. Mm. Wizards have a lot of spells. That's the uh, answer. You know, uh, locate object and scrying are things. Uh, okay. divi- like, she has access to high-level divination spells. Got you. You okay. took things that belong to her. Yep. She can find them again. Okay. Um, and, like, it was one of those things I didn't... A, I didn't think about it. And B, like, I didn't really want to think about it because it was just cool that she was... You know what I mean? And, like... Yeah. And you know that's my style. Like, if something is cool enough, I'm going to be like, suspension of dif- disbelief all day. Yeah. Let's do this. Like, this is cool. Rule of cool. And it was like, yeah, it was. this was the first time I stopped to think, wait a minute. The fuck did she just know? Like, I would imagine it would be a relatively low insight check because I created the character. And I know that probably not counting any enemies she may have made since her time kind of coming into Golgari and Consortium. I'm probably one of the, not threats, but like nuisances in her life that she would be able to be like, okay, I know who the fuck this was. Even without any magic kind of shit going on, but I never yeah. actually overtly asked you, so. Yeah, no, she she didn't know what was going on uh, when that happened. Uh, she had to She had to do some divination to figure out who was behind all this nonsense. But I think once she realized it was you, uh, yeah, she, she knew what she was going to do about it. And then, okay, so maybe you don't want to say too much about this, but what was Anel Gas thinking in the moment where she realized that Illipel is now aligned with the consortium? It is complicated, <laughs> but she's very confident that Illipel is, even though even though Illipel sort of blindsided her, she's a she's a true elf. She is confident that Illipel is beneath her as a mm. as a half elf. Them being aligned with the consortium doesn't really phase her too much, but she does see Illipel as a rival and as someone who needs to be kept in check. So that was the, why the whole, uh, you know, keep your name out of my mouth. If you yeah. say my name, I'm going to remotely suffocate you. Um, <laughs> Unless yeah. you uh, roll hot. <laughs> I'm going to try to remotely suffocate you. Um, I actually want to say one thing real quick here, actually, because I I, two things. One, they almost even agree to it, like without saying it, which is like, I have my corner of the world. You have your corner of the world. We are the type of people where our corners of the world can't touch, but Mm -hmm. we can probably enjoy what corners we build for ourselves. That And then two, like I find it incredible because – Illipel learned a lot of what they know about politicking and winning favor and gaining information from working for Anel Gas. Like that he worked mm-hmm. for her. And they are so similar. That arrogance, you know, like Illipel has the exact same point of view, which is just a sense of kind of arrogance about her. Like she is an arrogant, you know, I, I she is a nuisance to be kept in check and to monitor. Yeah. Um, really is like part of Illipel's thinking around Anel Gas. Illipel's probably a little more scared of Anel than Anel is of them, but they think very similarly, and it's probably a no part because mm. 
Illipel learned a lot of what they know from her. Yeah. Um, now, follow up question: What is now keeping on Elgast from killing Illipel now that they're no longer uh, aligned with something more powerful than her? <laughs> Contempt. Hmm. Uh, I think Illipel, or excuse me, I think Analgast has her own designs and hopes that she has scared Illipel enough off her trail that Illipel knows that they they can't they can't reasonably come after her. If they try, she will she will kill them. But she is content to believe for the moment that they have been taught their place, uh, and uh, knowing sort of what happened to them after sort of ties were cut between them and the consortium, uh, she thinks she's bought herself a little bit of breathing room, is all I'll say about that. She's got more important things to focus on. Wow. More important things. More important things. I know what the fuck that means. Yes, you do. Uh, I don't. I can't wait to find out next year so i uh, i guess talk a little bit more about how the uh the the sort of the back half of the campaign went post downtime stuff and then i mm-hmm. uh, i don't know well what were your what were your thoughts on sort of the way the the story sort of shifted in the back half uh was that satisfying did that come as a surprise when all of a sudden the cops showed up and you were kind of on the run and things changed no, I loved I loved that stuff. I loved I felt like a lot of our as someone that um enjoys the medium of television, I like the idea of like where discrete chunks of the story end. So whether that's an episode or a season. And I felt like a lot of our episode endings were very um like character driven episode endings. So an overt classic cliffhanger of like you're all under arrest felt really right at the time. We didn't have a lot of that flavor. So I enjoyed that. And also, mm-hmm. like, we ended a lot of sessions kind of knowing where our next lead was. And this was a time where it's like, wait, what What happens next? You know? And I think the three of us were kind of confident, like, there's going to be something. Like, we're not going to spend the last couple episodes in jail. But it felt really cool and different. And then the other thing is, um, two other things I want to note. Like, mechanically, um, the back half of the season was a lot of fun. I don't know where you consider the dungeon crawl, if that's kind of middle or back, but I consider it back half. Um, and then, like, the fights were really fun. Like, I loved uh, fighting Bippo again. I, I don't know why I love uh-huh. that fight scene. And then the other thing I like about the back half is it has to juggle some pretty intense character moments, like, especially with um, with Illipel and with Alwyn. And it has to juggle a lot of, you know, closing the narrative loop. But it's also fucking funny. Like, there are so many funny moments in the last few episodes. Like, and a lot of them are chloric yeah. moments. But, like, they're just, I don't know, the, the last, like, four, four, three or four episodes is just, it's got comedy, it's got combat, and it's got tension. And I, I thought the back half was really good. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I've been fairly transparent on these table talks that a lot of the lore went over my head, uh, both when we were playing it and even listening back and I kind of feel like um, there's a lot in there for uh, listeners who are Vorthoses, but it's also just incredibly entertaining anyway. Just the moment to moment. Uh, it's just a really well-paced game with like real stakes at every step on the ladder of like lore understanding and like moment to moment even um, type priorities for us. I agree. Big, yeah, there's big always agree. forward momentum, and I love that. Good, I'm I'm glad. I think that was I think one of my main concerns because I am so you know I'm like neck deep in you know all of this lore bullshit, but I I did want to make the game approachable to you and Jeppy who who don't have that sort of thing. I didn't want to get bogged down in all the details while keeping very faithful to the world that exists uh, and, and i'm glad i'm very cl- glad to hear that 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 you felt that way yeah oh the other thing I, about the second half of the game is that um you know in the first half we're doing this kind of uh detective espionage kind of solving a mystery thing and then in the second half it it's kind of 
almost formless um, compared with that, which, you know, there's still very much a story and forward motion, but it's not like uh, you're not going to have like the mystery denouement at the end. It doesn't um, it's not a it's no longer a genre piece after a certain point. Um, So, I yeah, I had no idea what to expect going into this end game. And from some of our discussions in Table Talk, I feel like your understanding of what was going to happen at the end changed quite a bit as the campaign was going on. I, as someone who's running the game, am very curious about the characters. And I've said this, I think I said this probably in the last Table Talk, I think, of just like, I want to keep things, it's so important to me to keep things truthful. And I just want to put stuff in the characters that gets a truthful response Uh, and what becomes of that is what's important and i can figure out what comes after that right i can i can Mm. plan a session in a week um but it's important that what you do matters and how you respond to what's being put before you i I guess no yeah i think that makes perfect sense definitely um talking about how you know the the shape of the campaign shifted over time. We're talking a little bit about getting into the back half. I'm actually curious, Scala, planning out the campaign. And I know you didn't you didn't completely front load it. Like you you had some episodes that you planned week before we did it. What was your favorite session or episode to plan? And then and then conversely, what ended up being your favorite at the DM chair? My favorite to plan, I think, was the dungeon. Uh, I I liked writing yeah, the dungeon. Sense. That makes sense. I liked. You know, building all of those, you know, little, little, little things that could have happened. Uh, I don't know. I liked just drawing out my little map on my, on, in my notebook. I, I thought that was fun. And, you know, I was like, ooh, yeah, I wonder if they'll touch the gold and get the never ending animated objects oh, trap man. activated. Uh, ooh, they, let's see if I can come up. I'm going to start with the answer of Eclipse. Let me see if I can come up with a four line poem that, uh, uh, asks the question, what is an eclipse? Uh, that was great. That was fun. Um, and I think my favorite episode to run uh, was one I didn't really plan at all, and that was uh, episode seven, Pause for Reflection, oh. uh, which is the name of a magic card uh, in uh, Guilds of Ravnica, I think. Uh, mm. it's, the, it's the title for that. I, I got one of them nice. in there. <laughs> nice. But... But your little fucking foray into the wilted pedal, I had no idea what was going to happen. Yeah. I was just like, I was, I was hanging on the edge of my seat. It's like, oh my god. Be realistic, Jeppy had no idea either. Yeah. No, um, and actually, uh, the the, you know, I I know I know you know, not a lot of this stuff means much to Jimmy, but I did enjoy playing that scene with Ral and Clark. Um, where I got to unload a bunch of fucking bullshit lore that only I care about, but I, and I also got to learn it relatively genuinely. Yeah, <laughs> not knowing it. Uh, I I also hope that you know we we got to see. I think we got to see a side of Clark that doesn't come out often. The the real like scientist in Clark, the the side of Clark that is curious and yeah, about yeah. the world and uh, yeah. Sorry, that, that, that there's there's no end yeah. to that. Oh. Even in the way it was edited, it was great. It was like exposition, you know, kind of like an exposition dump from the DM. And then Clark being like, ah, the fi-, like you just say the book title. Like you could get the sense of interest and intrigue from Clark because Clark's a naturally curious person who likes to learn. Yeah. And I thought that was really And the, cool. the cerebral jelly and even, oh uh, even like, you know, the, the whole thing with uh, Gorp and Zorp and being very interested in their machine and, and, you know, stuff like that. I, I think Clark uh, is a curious guy. He's not, he, he kind of acts kind of dumb, but in, in very specific ways, he's not. To sort of shift shift to a different question, those are awesome answers for those two episode questions. Um, but I see here a great prompt. Uh, what are some scenes that take on more meaning or depth after having all of the context? And a huge one comes to my mind. I'm curious if you have others that come to your minds of Jalen being sort of the the final champion of Medakaya and the Rogerva, um, having had all of the context of meeting him at the exchange and having him surround you with all of the Azorius. It just 
really makes that villain. Jeppy brought this up um, a number of times here and in previous table talks since we've introduced this character, but Jalen is not inherently evil. I don't think so, but has sort of was positioned on the opposite side of this conflict. And Mm -hmm. that just makes it like such a compelling character. Yeah. For, for someone who also, yeah, for someone who also didn't have a huge amount of screen time or dialogue, like it's very impactful. I think when I was editing episode nine or episode eight, episode eight was the exchange. I actually like, was listening back to that conversation that uh, Clark and Andy had with Jalen the first time you meet him. And I was like, oh my God, like now that you know, now yeah. that you know, listen to this shit. I yeah. like threw it into the discord. I was like, oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think this is something that is interesting about evil. It's weird that we're talking about this, like right when all of these like, changes to the alignment rules have happened. I mm. think Jalen is evil. I think Jalen is I think I think, you know, to a certain extent, the Azorius Senate are are tyrannical in nature. Um you know, they are interested in keeping everyone in their place. Places that don't really work for everyone who lives on this world, but their evil is very it's it's not it's not megalomaniacal. It's very methodical. They are committed entirely to the principles of 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 traditionalism and uh, hierarchy yeah and i, I don't that's definitely so, what yeah, i meant like that that's definitely what i meant they're not evil and like you know i'm a devil i'm gonna blow shit up they're evil and like uh their sole purpose is to maintain a status quo yeah exactly uh but yeah you know it, like Jalen is not a like Jalen like does not see himself as a villain. Uh, you know he sees himself as a principled person who will, uh, you know, do everything to make sure those principles are obeyed. Uh, like the con- like whatever comes of that is not his concern. Like he's a yeah. like he's not a good person. He's a cop. Uh, but why'd you say the same thing twice? <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, but uh but yeah like i also think i i i i like i think the reason he is compelling as a villain is because he is an absolutist to those principles principles which happen to be tyrannical mm. um one question i want to ask uh as well is i know like when when we were starting to plan season one, Andy had, at least to me, I think to everybody said like, what we're going, what, what I want to explore is this idea of heroism and fate. And I think those were like the big threads that the DM wanted to bring in. I don't want to use the word like thesis statement, but like that was the statement of purpose for like at least the character. Th- the theme. The theme, right? Yeah. Um, what would you say your goal was in terms of like for Ravnica? Overall? So the themes that, yeah, the themes I wanted to look at the themes that I think are interesting on Ravnica specifically are organizational, like organ, like the relationship organizations have to power. Generally speaking, there are a lot of powerful organizations, and they're all in a sort of tense stalemate with each other. So, how do they exert that power, and um, and how might they be used or challenged? or uh, avoided, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a, the clearest way to put it, but I think uh, I think the relationship that organizations have to power was in my mind as I was thinking about how I wanted to show this world. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there are any like I think I think one of my one of the things I'm proudest of is how I sort of layered things to the story. I don't know if, any of the rest of you got anything from a second from like listening to it after you played? I know I got plenty of stuff, but was there anything you guys like picked up on? Uh, you know, was was a cool like uh, reveal to you on a second listen? I already talked about some of mine, which and they all a lot of them have to do with like Illipel and the things that I know most about because like I'm not going to catch some of the lore bits. The other big one is Medicaia. 
Um, one thing that's like probably less extremely important to the narrative arc of our characters, but I found interesting was after he revealed that Tomek and Ral are a couple like that adds a little bit of, I think flavor, you know, to, to the interactions in the first episode. But yeah, I think the big ones I already talked about. Yeah. I, 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 I've made this known, but like as a player, I'm so like in it that I, I miss so many things. Oh, and so, yeah. And so like the lore stuff, the lore stuff I, I pick up just because, you know, like most of it I already know, but like all of these little hints and nods to interpersonal relationships or clues and breadcrumbs and stuff, I miss so much of that shit. So like on the on the second, third, you know, sixth time around if I'm doing music or something, it's like, oh man, I didn't even realize that like uh Anel Gast was sort of behind the er- the first eternal encounter that the party had like you know mm-hmm. stuff like that yes, yeah yeah and and Vim was Niv Mizzet all along well yeah <laughs> that's just me being really dumb no it's not it was <laughs> you it guys was, didn't i mean i didn't know i actually yeah. i still didn't know even in the episode my reaction was genuine mm. when you said Clark you usually bow that's oh, when yeah. i realized <laughs> <laughs> i forgot so, i said that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot two of my favorite off. That was definitely one, and I think the, the minute Elwyn says that I won't be beating your head in for lying to me, and he says, well, that would be a riveting experiment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. and then the other, like, favorite little Easter egg of mine is the ring that Jeppy gets, and I tried very uh, hard to avoid saying this, is in, is one made of Ethereum, uh, I describe it in a way that sounds like Ethereum, so it's f- like, and is uh, sh- shaped as an infinity symbol. Uh, that's why it slides over the two fingers. So it's like, those are the two hints uh, that like you get right when he gets it. He's, he gets the infinity symbol ring, and uh, Tezzeret says, welcome to the consortium. And like, if if you were paying, like, if you were like, like deep into this fucking shit as I am uh, you like might have picked it up right there it's like oh shit the infinite consortium oh shit uh, the ring is Ethereum uh, it's Tezzeret Tezzeret's wanna, the bad guy I want to give honorable mention to the word Lemniscuit that you slipped in there at one point yeah that was good that's a good one uh, but enough about me like we, we like can we talk about how good the, the music and the sound design was for this season uh, the it fucking sounds that you did for the fucking membrane doors, Jimmy, like, <laughs> still haunt my dreams. I love them so yeah, much. Yeah, it's just really bad. It's so good. It's bad. Yeah. It's so bad. It's good. I mean, good. If, if we actually want to talk about this for a minute. Yeah, I, I wanted those to be gross. I wanted to evoke the grossness of walking through that membrane. But it's not just the sound, the squishing of the membrane itself. It's also that when you go inside it the sounds of the outside world kind of um, get muffled and muted. And yeah. so it kind of, if you're wearing headphones, you get this feeling that you're you're in like almost underwater, but it's mushy. Yeah, I kind of, I, I spent like an hour on just that sound. And I was glad I got to reuse it in multiple episodes because, yeah, that was a good one. There's a few like other little ones. I think uh, also the Cerebral Jelly was also a nice little yeah, a lot of the Simic project stuff and disgusting really stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, the explosion of the uh, flesh uh, oh, amalgam. No. Oh God! I think all the work you did viscera. on the, the chaos bolt warbles that th- those oh, were all yes. really cool. Oh, yeah, yeah and those are um, actually um, th- that's actually a synthesizer that has a, a randomized envelope on it, so it's different every time I render it. Oh, that's um, it's so actually cool. random in the moment, which yeah. is awesome. Fucking is perfect for that's so true good. chaos. It's ah, every time. That's yeah. so good. <laughs> yes, I love it. Yeah. Um, and then the music is just you know it's we we transitioned out of Garage Band almost towards the end of Theros. So this campaign come right out of the gate with higher quality VSTs and who baby it, it's just yeah. so good. I mean, Garage I, Band has its place. I, it, it does, does. and tough. I and I never. There were some episodes here where I didn't use it at all, but anything with a drum set or most of the rhythm percussion stuff is still in Garage Band because it's 
so much easier and faster oh, to do. Yeah, yeah. And their sounds are decent, but when it comes to orchestral instruments, yeah, having having um a, a full suite of of professional sounds was just so good. Yeah. And then also having every instrument on its own um track. Yeah. For mixing purposes, a lot of, everything lot of tracking, just came out crisper. I could EQ every different. instrument separately to pull out all those little extraneous noises. Yeah. And and all of that really goes into sort of Jimmy's concepts for, for sound design in general. It was um, a lot more methodical. And um, having the experience from season one writing all of the music the way we did and then going into season two, um, yeah, it just felt great. And the sounds, I mean... My primary goal was to make it sound very, my primary goals, very different from Theros, which is much mm. more, I feel, cinematic and sort of film score-y in the way that like an Indiana Jones or a Jurassic Park or a Gladiator or something are compared to something that's a lot more introspective, a lot more like, you know, if you were to listen to like... Uh, an album or a mixtape or something about events in one's life. Um, sort of more biographical music rather than cinematic music. Yeah, and that's that's interesting. And you, you kind of said already you tied that into the sound design, but this season in general just had much smaller moments than Theros. Theros is this huge, sweeping, big combats and characters flying through the air with battle axes. Yeah, and it's like so good. This is a lot of like people talking close to each other about things that really matter to them. Yeah. Yeah, and the music, yeah. Like the little bar scenes that I did, all of the piano oh. work that went into Illipel or any various, mm. you know, scenes yep. conversationally. That's a big thing. It's like... I got into this habit of, like, in Ravnica, the most compelling music is often underscoring dialogue. It's not huge, it's not over-the-top, but it is very emotive for the moment yeah. that it's scoring. I mean, let's let's be real, some of those combat scores are bops, though. The, they are, the, but, like... <laughs> Uh, uh, the, 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 the Rakdos devil fight, the angel oh, fight, man. the fucking fight in the sanctum of the primordial gyre. Yeah. Uh, Even like, just the skeletons with the little, you know, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <it's> so good. <laughs> There's definitely like, I, cause I can't, I can't go full. I can't like max full score every combat. It would take, right. you know, 10 times longer to do. And I'm trying to do these on a weekly basis. So it's like. Some of them, um, even, and I'll be honest, actually the first big fight, the, the, the shop fight. Um, yeah, with the, with the, uh, cleric. Yeah, it took a long time because I was really trying to find sort of new sounds for how I wanted these combats to fight. And then after that, it sort of, you know, started yeah. rolling into things. Um, so that one took a really long time and was very complicated. Um, mm, that key changes and shit. A lot of counterpoint and like actual classical <laughs> quotes and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And then after that, I was like, no, this took like 10 <laughs> hours to do just this combat. I can't do And it this took again. me like an hour or two to mix that yeah. sequence alone. But yeah. then I found other ways to do music that was like just as powerful with like the Rakdos fight, which is basically just two electric guitars ripping at each other for an entire <laughs> combat. Yeah. It, uh, horns come in at certain points yeah. and go away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, fucking Clark's steampunk percussion, like, uh, oh, that's so great. genius. Yeah. Oh. I love that shit. No, I, I did like like that a lot. Yeah, it was good. And I like how you kind of you gave it kind of like the concerto treatment in the uh, the Bippo fight. You mm. kind of blew out all of that. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Mechanical sounds into like what would that sound like as a full composition? For sure. And that's, oh, cool. I mean, that is sort of what I'm doing with all of the character themes during combats is, is, you know, they are sort of classically, everyone's getting their turn musically when it's their turn in combat to an extent. Right. There's yeah, sometimes the when I'm not passing the instruments around it and it'll just be the themes, but otherwise, yeah. Sure. I knew, uh, I knew going in, Clark's theme was going to be one of my favorites. Oh yeah. And then the clarinet and oh. trombone bass lines. Yep. Yeah. It's good stuff. I like 
I think it was it wasn't until like episode six or seven you brought in that little five four electric piano yes. vamp. Yeah, that was during yeah. the downtime because yeah. it it was sort of this different it was this different take on what we see of Clork, and so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna riff a little take five here. That feels right. Yeah, it was great. And then there's like an improvised clarinet solo over yeah. the sequence too. It's very cool stuff. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. All right, few few rapid fire things before we announce the next season. Uh, we did it for Theros. Cast yourself. We already know oh, uh, fucking Kit Harrington for Alwyn. Yeah, but, I mean, uh... come on, come on. There's literally <laughs> nothing else you could do. Oh, mm. Mm. can I play Clark? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> their debut role, James of Hotagot. Shit, I'm stumped. That's Illipel's a tough one. Illipel is a tough one. How like how old in human years would Illipel look? Any anywhere but to, like to to be cast by a, uh, an actor anywhere from like thirty to forty five a forty year old actor could probably handle it. Maybe okay. a couple of years outside that range. Like on the older end, like oh god, Steve. I, I would. Uh, yeah. I no, that's for Clark. Like, <laughs> like, not visually at all, but, like, I feel like Andy Serkis would be a fun person to play a really chaotic, conniving character in this way. Okay. Um, He's done, like, some dramatic roles. Yeah. yeah. You know, honestly, I, like, also, this person is much too old for the role, and I know this is going to sound fucking crazy, and now I can't think Uh-oh. of this person's name. Not a movie star. Um, oh, my God. Food Network star. Oh, my God. Guy, Guy Fieri? Fieri? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hold on. I'm going to look it up. Who? What show? What are you talking Gordon about? Gordon Ramsay? No, 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 no. Bet that is how Illipel runs a kitchen, though. Like a complete jackass. Alton Brown. Alton Brown. Alton, Alton Brown, 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 actually. Yeah. Alton Brown, honestly, like, no, not joking. Like, de-aged a little bit, very different visually. And I also like, fuck age, who cares? Alton Brown, for me, like, the way Alton Brown's uh, tone and cadence and inflections are is just so fun. And I feel like they would play this kind of, like, slimy, slithery character really well yeah. for some reason. Alton Brown is my answer. It's a weird one, but I'm going with Alton Brown. I like it. I like it. Nice. Right. And I, I kind of accidentally landed on Steve Buscemi, but I think that is a good choice for Clark. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great choice. Yes, it is. So... Uh, about half a year will pass between when this ends and when you have to go to Jason's hearing. Uh, what are your what are your what are you guys going to be up to? I will not. I already said I will not answer that question, and I will not answer that question. You're Sorry. gonna you're gonna send me a direct message with the answer. All right. Oh yeah, no no I, yeah I'm not planning on blindsiding the DM. With like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I went Jeffy. To Vera. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. That's fair. It's a fair criticism. Um. Alwyn will be trying to deal with Edric, um, and also, um, wandering the halls of Stonehaven, thinking about all of the things that are not starting to add up with Illipel. Mm. Clark is going to, uh, having learned nothing, Clark <laughs> is going to continue his meteoric rise up the ranks of the Izzet League, making enemies every step of the way. <laughs> just bullying people basically um, uh, okay yeah maybe the, the big question for those that don't listen to table talks check out patreon table talks we ask it every week but we're gonna ask for the whole season favorite moment oh my god entire season favorite moment uh, mm. all right i'll i'll go first uh, you know ask me to pick a favorite child um <sighs> andy I've got one. I've got one. Um, many of them were favorite moments of Table Talk. Hashtag Patreon. Hashtag Table Talk. Hashtag subscribe. Um, I don't know how hashtags work. Hashtag um, Patreon. So um, many of the dramatic conversations between Edric and Alwyn became sticking points for um, you know us talking about role play during the Table Talks. Um, I think of all of them, if I had to pick a favorite, it would be on the bridge coming back to Stonehaven after fighting the Amalgam. Nice. That felt like the rawest, the realest, um, mm-hmm. just 
yeah, it was it was just peak role play. All right, so mine happened t- kind of towards the end of the season, and my opinion on this will probably change. But Illipel deciding to cut their fingers off was a genuine surprise to me. <laughs> and again, I seeded that with no expectations. I I seeded the ring with no expectations, um, and seeing how that grew how that caused this tension with Alwyn, and how it culminated in Illipel making this, what I thought was an incredibly, almost selfless choice. But maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's another angle. Yeah, Jeffy's giving me the wishy-washy hand. To commit, to like, make a commitment in a way that Illipel is very slippery, very non-committal. Uh, but having Illipel make this dire commitment with, uh, with, you know... No expectations. That, and then obviously getting to fucking do, like, uh, evil-on-evil violence villain stuff with Tezzeret showing up in your dream and crushing your head. Uh, That was fun, too. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. So good. We all enjoyed that. And the underscoring. Oh, my God. Tezzeret's music I had so much fun with. so good. (laughs) Great. Yeah, can't, can't not bring that up. That was great. I think in general, a lot of my favorite parts of the season are just Scala's voices, like the uh, Niv-Mizzet voice, um, the fire, even like there's a uh, Glizix, Glizix. It's Glizix. oh yeah. Sorry. Oh, my answer my is Glizix. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, wait, uh, Scala even like like bounced up and down when doing the yeah. It was like yeah. so good, so yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, and then uh. like. As, and then I'm designing effects to put on those voices. Half the work's already done for me, you know? Like the, the, the whole... clicking and clacking of the insect doors. I'm like, oh my. Yeah. It's not even effects. <laughs> it's just a human mouth. I know. But even like, w- but with Glizix, like I put a little bit of tremolo on there to give it this kind of electricity sound. But like everything else is, is Scala. It's, it's the actual tone of their voice yeah. doing that. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, so good. And then to have the uh, I, I I I've praised you for this before, but having a conversation between two different characters and two different voices is very difficult to do, and you don't make it sound difficult. Yeah, true and real. And there's Absolutely minimal true edits, and real. too. It's it's not like yeah. we have to wait a minute for Scala to find the voice. <laughs> it's like that's just happening. Yeah, we might de s it and de air it a little bit, but it's yeah. minimally edited. Yeah, the conversation cool. between like the Orjab functionary and Niv Mizzet that we walk into the middle of, oh, so and they're good. they're at two different dynamic levels. They're just like there's there couldn't be more different, and you're doing it perfectly. Very thank impressive. you. Hey, hey, Watsi, cast me to voice Niv Mizzet in the animated series, please. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cast me to do additional voices in the animated series, please. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, my favorite moment is, um, is the first scene with Illipel. And the reason is, uh, honestly, and I mentioned it before, like season one, I was not confident, uh, as a player, certainly not confident as someone recording for a podcast. So like still having some of that coming into season two and I made a pretty ambitious character, you know, has to be in the know. And I was really nervous about that. And then that first scene, A, I think it's a lot of fun. B, the voices are great. The music is cool. But I remember when we recorded it, not even when I listened back, but as soon as we finished that scene and went on to Clark, I felt like, all right, I made the right choice. Illipel is the character for this campaign, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So like that, there are so many good scenes, but I think that one takes takes the win for me. And then I'll add my favorite memory of season two real quick is – when May and I came up to New York and we all listened to the tavern music for the first time together in the room. Oh, oh yeah. That was so That was really fun. nice. God, that was ages ago, too. Wow. Yeah. yeah 12 quick, weeks quick ago. Quick little thing about that first scene, uh, Illifel, that just came to mind as you, Jeppy, as you mentioned that, was I think that's like one of the few times that Illipel is in the room uh, with someone who is as competent or even a more competent uh, yeah. you know, negotiator than they are. And it's like that, I think that really comes alive. Illipel is usually can work a person and work an angle on a person. You can't, like, you can't work Tomic like that. He's Tasa Karlov's apprentice. He, like, knows what the fuck is up. Um, yeah. Oh, so good. Yeah. So yeah. good. Our first introduction to Illipel is just getting slapped around by Tomic. Oh, uh, it's yeah. great. Ah. Uh, love it. I love it. What a fun season. Uh, can't wait to go back. All right. 
Well, what happens next? Now that Ravnik is over. Oh, what happens next? Jeppy. Season three. Jeppy. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, I DM, I DM season three, which will be interesting considering how I play chaotically. Uh, we'll see if that translates to my DMing. Um, but yeah, very excited about it. Um, it will pick up next week. Um, and this time of year seems like the right time of year because uh, we will be going up north where... In the frigid, tundric wastes of Icewind Dale, great evil looms. So listen, string of murders, all around Fail Barrage. Lately, right here in Cairdenaval. So you work with a company. Vetus? That's right. And how do you people feel about Vetus? We're just hoping y'all do the right thing. Find out who's doing this. The character of Icewind Dale has shifted from the majestic to something industrial. Guess you need all the help you can get around here with your union dissolved. Clearly this contract does not state for you to give me advice on how to run my fucking business unflinching, resolute, and colder than ever before. Why'd you help him like that? It's the neighborly thing to do. Sure, but we're not his neighbors. We are here to do a job, not to fix the world and its problems. Hey, the three of you, huh? Kiss has been expecting you. A middle-aged halfling beams from beneath a broad-brimmed straw hat. The creases on their face suggest that they're often of this sunny disposition. May not look like it. I've had some days as an outlaw. You see a tall, gaunt silhouette. His equipment and arms give the impression of a fierce monster hunter. You'd see no breath drawn from this figure, as he wears the frostbite on his fingers like the dirt on his boots. Weary and long-traveled. The answers I seek, they are not as simple as asking around this place or that. You see a lanky, young-looking elf with pale blue skin. He wears clothes befitting a dock worker of the north. A hat with ear flaps partly covers his scraggly, wet-looking green hair. I don't want to spend my whole life just hauling rope, so decided I need to get out and see the world. Lots of people are upset with Phil Barashri. But when they are so eager to fill your pockets, how can one refuse? Lots of people have a particular interest in undermining what they're doing. Do you think Fail Barosh is the type of person who's going to quietly and peaceably part with his sources of income? It's always so easy for you people to talk about consequences and actions when you don't know how we live. I'm really sorry I have to do this, and I'm going to take a step forward and lunge my saber right into his stomach. I strum my banjo, and little sparks fly from my fingers, and they scatter off into the air and dust these two cultists. Without missing a beat, I fire in that moment of surprise and strike it through the chest. Come, Shiva, we have found more prey. Oh, no. They found us. They found us. Tim. 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 <laughs> Tim. Tim. No, it's Tim. 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 Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's well. so different. Yeah, it's so different. <laughs> what do you mean? It's definitely, uh, it's definitely a game that is run by Jeppy. Yeah, <laughs> and that it's is really... all I will say. I mean, yeah, it's uh, Jeppy DMing for the first time. Uh, Jeppy, who's only really been playing D anD D for a little over a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I played like what, six games, literally not 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 campaigns, games. Uh, before the first ever episode of Pods, so yeah, yeah I'm 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 new to D and D, and that's also my first tabletop. So it's not even like I'm adept at other tabletops. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, just it's a fun mildly, experiment. Mildly, mildly nerve wracking DMing uh, for the first time after not playing for very long, and then doing it for a podcast I care greatly about. Um, fortunately, doing it with some of my favorite people in the world, so that's cool. But yeah, I'm really, really excited about it. I'm excited about the characters that the three of you have chosen are like, they're just they're they're a lot of fun <laughs> to work with. And the ele- what's funny is like there's an element of chaos in Illapel that we've been talking about a lot in, in the table talks and, and in this talk back episode, but there's other L forms of chaos in at least two of the player characters in in season three and i'm very excited about how that may pan out against what may or may not be a chaotic dm yeah there's just a very chaotic world going on too yes (laughs) but it's a lot of fun and it it is like it's fresh it's like um learning how to play all over again in some ways (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah um 
Yeah, I don't really know what to say about it because I don't want to reveal too much. But um, yeah, it's Icewind Dale. It's Icewind Dale and it's the same people. And even though it takes place in a city and they're solving a kind of mystery, I think it's safe to say it couldn't be any more different than Ravnica. I think I think something you might be selling yourself short on that we haven't really talked about, and I'll, I'll try and say this without giving too much away, but there is a there is a strong overtly ethical component to the way you run the game uh, mm. you know i like i think um yeah I, I think that is much that is at the forefront of your considerations for writing this game and i think that is something that is very interesting to explore especially with the characters that we're bringing oh yeah. yes yeah thank oh, yeah. you i think that is a great spoiler free way to say if you're interested in ethical moral dilemmas and how three very different types of people may navigate that in a very cold and unforgiving environment i think you'll enjoy our third season and i think that that, that ought to do it is that's ravnica that's Rav- that's ravnica table talk it's ravnica table talk <laughs> it's a wrap right. on season two thanks for listening bye <laughs> thank you let me take that again because I ran out of breath. Okay, editing got it. this is going to be a nightmare. Clorks heroics against Bopo. Bippo. I was just going to mention it. that, but I thought it'd be too much of a joke. <laughs> Fuck. The name Metayaka. It's a Metakaya. Uh, what's that? Sh- Shagthir's bones. What? What the fuck is that guy's Spog- name? Spogthir's bones. Spogthir. Thank you. <laughs> Unless you have any better armor. Any bitter. Better armor. <laughs> better armor. Fucking word I'm looking for. Um, Cacophonous. I already said cacophonous. God, fuck, words are hard. Put that on a t-shirt. Some scrolls roost, roostly lulled. <clears throat> um, Surely Lady Vuliav is not the only particular. Do you want to roll hearing, healing spirit? I point it out. I say, Griminor hmm. lot. Shit. And I say, um. <laughs> words are hard. That's the theme for tonight. Um, words are hard. I met the three of you. The three of you? You mean the, the three of Fuck. You? <laughs> it's a disconnect button. Am I still late? No. It fixed. It, it fixed. <laughs> it fixed. And click snar- snarls or whatever the fuck that just was. Yes, clicks. Appears from Theros. A plane of rift opens. Woo, 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 woo. Clicks will look down clicks? at their mangled. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll take it again. Sounds most. Now that just sounds twangy. Yeah. Sounds is a hard word in Illipel's voice. Oh, let me get this fucker's voice. This fucking stupid clown voice. Well? I mean, Minotaur voice. I always want to slip into fucking Volkos. Snow. John Snow. John. There it is. You have it. Yeah, it's hard It's hard not to do it, right? I hate you. I hate you and I hate Alwyn so much. Brother. Snow. No nothing. Bro. There we go. Brother. Wow. Uh, no, nope, that was that was Ral's voice. Uh, <laughs> I'm a I'm a goblin. Why well, can't I think of Illipo's voice? Hold on. I think it. Don't does. don't do other voices and fuck with me. <laughs> I'm doing your voice. <laughs> Sorry, not to interrupt. Get your hands away from your mouth. Please. No, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Get all the sounds in. Barb. Uh. <laughs> Whoops. Bah, 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 bah. Don't like those odds. Bah. Very emotional creatures. Mm. It's quite beautiful. Uh, bah, 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 bah. I am known to wax philosophical. Switching back and forth between modifiers. It's a. Socio political commentary. You. Random name time. Ah, boy. Or at least mine is a scavenger. I sure can make up some bullshit right now. Quickly, just write write frogs into this combat and it'll be fine. (laughs) You see in the shadows a chorus of croaking frogs emerge. Sneaky animals, conniving animals, and the first result was Californian ground squirrel. (laughs) Say that (laughs) again. Yes. What did the guy just say its name was? Amul or Amon or something like that? I didn't write it down. Give a warm welcome to... Uh... What's this guy's name? Xenos. Gold. Zib. 
copper or whatever. We bitch at Jeppy for not using it, and then we <laughs> don't use it. We're just used to not having it. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's still my fault. Okay. I'm going to audit this entire campaign and see how many times I've, I've popped the fucking Bardic Inspiration. I think it's been plenty, but I was not going to make that <laughs> mental gymnastically, organically. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I've given you more clues than anyone. Andy's looking at me like, fuck Illipel. So Illipel's drama doesn't matter to you? Uh, it doesn't matter to Clork, and I think I was doing a pretty good job of uh, there you go. living the role. <laughs> really method, method acting. acting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're doing something Clork doesn't care about. Let me Google some shit. Play Factorio. <laughs> oh my god, Clork would fucking play Factorio. Holy Clark shit. would love Factorio. Help me with this. Yes, what's go. The sec- go what's the there. No, no, I'm, I'm just, just here for go. Clork. I'm literally here just, for Clork. Just, just take it okay, again and keep going. What should I do then? Damage. Yeah, but okay. That's what he should do. Bah. Well, we can just try and burn the whole thing down. I like to burn things. I don't have any flame spells. Me neither. Yours went to the perfume, but mine went to my undercity stink. Yeah, no, right? that was that's, what everyone thought. That's, what, that's yeah. what I thought. I did, you know, the Joe Biden escape hatch. <laughs> oh God. God, come on, man. Illipel puts um, their PlayStation 4 headset back on their head. <laughs> <laughs> We're done with Illipel. Finally, thank All fucking right. God. I'm ready to play somebody nicer. A mine! I ain't been dropping no Eve, sir. I opened up and I just saw the picture of Elijah Wood with scuba gear on. <laughs> <laughs>